Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar in the Bright Talk Academy, the Science of Memorable and Persuasive Marketing Presentations. My name is Taylor Freitas, and I'm on the content marketing team here at Bright Talk. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Susanna Shattuck, who is the content marketing manager at Prezi. And Hi, everyone. In... Hi, Susanna. Um, in today's session, Susanna is going to discuss the science behind what makes a memorable and persuasive presentation, and she's also going to offer some tips for making your presentations more conversational and interactive. And then I'll be back following that to share some ideas about how to make your online presentations more engaging and applying in-person delivery techniques to your online presentations. So I will hand the mic over to Susanna in just a second here, but please bear with me for a moment while I cover just a few quick housekeeping items about our presentation and about the Bright Talk platform. So first off, uh, just so you know, today's webinar will be available on demand after we wrap up live. You can access it through the same URL you're on right now, and you can also access it through the social sharing icons down at the bottom right of your player. And we've also added some attachments. You can access those through the Attachments tab at the bottom of your screen. And in there, you can find um, some related content, including we've got a couple ebooks, a guide, and some blog posts, all that good stuff in there. So feel free to explore that. And last thing I wanted to note, if you have a question during the presentation today, you can ask that at any time using the Ask a Question tab. And that's right beneath your player as well. Um, and you can also tweet us at Bright Talk. We'll be answering questions throughout the session, and we're going to be doing a Q&A at the end. But if we don't get to your question during the webinar, um, just know that we will be sure to follow up with you afterwards. So rest assured there. And without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Susanna. And we're really excited to have you back on the Bright Talk Academy today, Susanna. And I will let Thank you take you. it from here. Yeah. Thanks so much, Taylor. I am thrilled to be back as well. Um, I love talking about the science of effective presentations, and today we're going to be focusing on, you know, how to be more memorable and persuasive. Um, but this is one of my favorite topics, so thanks for having me. Um, so I, as Taylor mentioned, am the content marketing manager at Prezi. If you guys are unfamiliar with Prezi, it is a presentation. Um, software you will be seeing it today. We're presenting with Prezi today. Um, and you know at Prezi we are really passionate about helping people create and deliver more effective presentations. Because if you think about it, presenting is really one of the most important things that we do at work, you know, especially as marketers, um, between creating decks for the sales team to pitch to prospective customers. Um, giving project updates to senior management, developing presentations for lead generating webinars like this one. Uh, delivering an effective talk can really make your career, and an ineffective one can also, you know, sort of set you back. So it's really important to understand how to create these kinds of presentations that not only stick in your audience's minds, but also convince them to take whatever action it is you want them to take. Um, you know, no matter what kind of presentation you're giving, the goal is always to communicate a message that engages your audience, sticks in their minds, and persuades them to take that action. So to understand how to create a presentation that's both memorable and persuasive, it's really important to understand how your audience's brains work. And this is where the science comes in. Psychologists and neuroscientists and researchers have been doing a lot of work to understand how people respond to different types of stimuli. And this research, when applied to presentations, can actually help us understand what kinds of content work best when it comes to creating memorable, persuasive presentations. So the science shows us that we are hardwired to respond particularly well to two kinds of content, stories, and interactive conversations. Those are the two tactics that I'm really going to be diving into today, helping you understand why stories and um, interactivity are so critical to creating presentations that are memorable and persuasive, and then providing you with some tips for how you can apply stories and interactivity to your presentations. So 
let's dive into the research and find out why and how these things work. First, let's talk about stories. So research has shown that a story is one of the most powerful tools in a presenter's arsenal. And honestly, most business presenters don't really make full use of this tool. If you think about the last presentation you sat through at work, did the presenter tell a story or was she just presenting facts and figures um, and analysis? So according to the memory expert, Carmen Simon, um, she's a neuroscientist and an author, really fabulous. I recommend you, you check out some of her work. Um, you know, stories are made up of three pillars, cognitive, perceptive, and effective components. Most business presenters are really great at getting across the cognitive aspects of their stories. You know, the facts, figures, and abstract concepts that support their arguments. But where many presenters fall short in the workplace is the perceptive and effective components of their presentations. These are things like the descriptive details that really make a story come to life, the emotion that makes it meaningful, um, you know, using uh, metaphors and uh, descriptive language, touch, t uh, taste, s smell, sight, to really bring your story to life. And then explaining um, the emotion behind what makes your story meaningful is really critical to telling a great story and to actually getting some of the neuroscientific benefits of storytelling within your audience. Now, what are those benefits? Let's, let's think about how the human brain works and why stories are so critical here. Um, you know, building all three of these story components into your presentations is scientifically proven to make your presentations more engaging and memorable because when we tell stories that are rich with descriptive details, with metaphors, with emotional triggers, we are actually engaging more parts of our audience's brains than when we simply recite facts and stats. So when you think, say things like, his voice was like velvet, or she smelled of perfume, your audience's sensory cortex is triggered. That's the part of the brain that processes senses, like touch and smell. So hearing those descriptive phrases from a brain activity standpoint is really not very different from actually experiencing those sensations in real life. You can see that in this image, you know, this is obviously a um, graphic representation, not scientific at all, but more parts of your audience's brain um, is, is lighting up when you use these sort of descriptive stories. Now, on the other hand, when you don't use descriptive language and you simply state facts, for example, the marketing team reached all of its revenue goals in Q3. That sentence only triggers the part of your audience's brains that is dedicated to understanding language. So instead of experiencing the content you're sharing, your audience is simply processing it. And if you really want to bring your message to life, quite literally, in the minds of your audience, then you need to tell stories that engage their whole brain. And when you do that, you'll find that they are way more interested in what you have to say, and they're much more likely to remember it after you've stopped talking, because it's as if they experienced it themselves. Now, stories are also a key tool in persuading your audience to take action. Think about some of your earliest memories. They probably involve stories that your parents and teachers told you to help you learn about the world and how it works. Those are some of my earliest memories anyway. You know, we use stories to convince other people to see things our way and to teach people about how things should happen in the world, including children. Now, there's actually some really great scientific research that proves that storytelling is a really great way to, you know, get people to take action. It's um, a study conducted by a marketing professor at Wharton Business School, and in this study, researchers divided volunteers into two groups and they showed each group a separate fundraising brochure for the Save the Children Foundation. Now the goals of the brochure were the same, to get people to donate. That was the ask of each brochure, but the way that they went about it in each brochure was slightly different. The first group saw a brochure that told a story of Rokia, 
um, who was a girl whose life would be directly impacted by donations to the charity. And the second brochure laid out a lot of facts and figures about global poverty and hunger, things like 40 million people go hungry every day in Ethiopia. Um, you know, these, these images are meant to represent the sort of two tactics that each brochure took. Now, the researchers found that the group that had seen the first brochure, that is the story, the brochure with the story of Rokia, donated twice as much to the Save the Children Foundation as the group that had seen the second brochure. That is to say that the story was two times more effective at driving donations, at inspiring the audience to take that action than the facts and figures were. And if that doesn't convince you of the power of stories to persuade and drive action, then I'm not sure what will. Um, so that's a bit about the science of storytelling. Now, before I move on to talking about interactivity, are there any questions, Taylor, that have come up from the audience? during that section we do have a question that came in and let's see it says how can you make something fact driven like the marketing a team reached its revenue goal in q3 more persuasive like his voice was like velvet that is a really great question um so there's a lot of great writing and and research on sort of how to build an effective story particularly i would definitely look into um, advice from the Pixar folks, because Pixar, as we all probably know, knows how to tell a really great story. And um, I read a while ago that one of the key things to do when you're thinking about how to turn something that's sort of fact-driven uh, into a story is to start with who the characters are. So in that sentence, the marketing team um, reached all of its revenue goals in Q3. The characters are you know, the different members of the marketing team. And the story is about what they did to reach those revenue goals. You know, maybe they were really working hard to launch this campaign. They stayed up late into the night to, to make sure that all of the assets were ready to go by the launch date. And they put in all these blood, sweat, and tears to the hard work, and it paid off because the campaign ended up being a huge success. So I think focusing... Thinking, starting to think about who the characters are, who are playing a role in whatever facts and figures you're working with. You know, the Rokia example is really great too, because the facts and figures about poverty and hunger and the needs of, of these children in Africa were really brought to life when you focus on a single character who becomes sort of a stand-in for the bigger numbers. And it's much more relatable to hear the story from the perspective of a single character than to talk about these really big numbers, 40 million, you know, is, is sort of meaningless. Um, so that's, I would say, a good place to start. And like I said, definitely check out what the folks from Pixar have to say about storytelling because they have some really good tips that are very applicable in business. Is there anything else, Taylor, or should we dive into interactivity? I think that's good. We there were a lot of there were a few questions around the same kind of topic about effectively using stories in B two B scenarios. Okay. But I think you just you you just addressed that. So I think we're good to cool. go. Cool. And we can we can cover that again in the Q and A afterwards if more questions about that come up. Um, so let's dive into uh, talking about how turning your one way presentation into a two-way conversation is really key as well to being memorable and persuasive. So we recently ran a survey amongst the Prezi community asking them about the kinds of presentations that they actually find most effective as audience members to try to sort of get a pulse on, um, you know, what the best presenters are doing to really engage people. And the results were pretty staggering. More than half of the people that we surveyed agreed that interactive two-way presentations were more effective than traditional one-way presentations across all the categories where we asked. So, you know, 66% of people reported that they found these flexible, interactive presentations to be more memorable than what we called linear passive presentations. That is, they found presentations where the presenter was changing the course of what they were talking about based on input from the audience, much more memorable than presentations where the, the presenter was just going through a script that was set 
you know, regardless of what the audience was interested in talking about. And 65% of people reported that these interactive presentations are more persuasive than passive presentations. And you can see here that only 3% of our um, survey participants said that linear passive presentations are more memorable and 5% said they're more persuasive. So if you compare those two numbers, it's, it's pretty clear that um, the vast majority of people prefer these interactive experiences as audience members. And we aren't the only ones who found this result. There have been a bunch of other studies about the power of interactive content and interactive experiences. Um, and you know, one of the studies that has recently been conducted that's pretty clear on this is from the Internet Advertising Bureau, where uh, researchers have found that people are much more likely to remember which brands are associated with certain products when first presented with the information in an interactive format versus a static format. So this Internet Advertising Bureau study, um, they asked a thousand adults to rate different types of ad content and twice as many consumers in the study said that interactive ads were memorable compared to static ads. So, you know, just another proof point that interactivity is really key when you want your audience to remember and, and be very engaged um, and persuaded. So you might be thinking, wow, how do I even begin to go about turning my presentation from you know, a one-way experience, which I think is what most of us are accustomed to when we're thinking about creating a presentation, um, how do you make that into a two-way interactive experience for your audience? Well, for one thing, you're gonna need to throw the idea of a script out the window. Um, you know, conversational presenting requires thinking a little bit differently about developing and delivering your content. You're going to want to develop a loose set of talking points for your presentation. Let me demonstrate what I mean by this. Um, let's say your presentation has three major parts. A customer success story, an overview of the product offering, and an outline of pricing plans. Come up with the key points that you would like to say within each of those three sections but then don't decide on what the order is in which you'll present them until you begin presenting. So the key here is really to create this roadmap of your presentation and then let your audience drive. You can create an overview which shows each of the different topics you wanna to discuss. And when it comes time to present, ask your audience what they would like to talk about first. So if they pick pricing plans, great launch into your talking points for that section and skip the customer success story and, and the product offering. If they pick case studies, don't get thrown for a loop. Just launch directly into your talking points for that section. So your ability to really change the flow of your presentation based on what your audience is most interested in is not only going to um, you know, make that experience more interactive for them, it's also going to allow you to dive right into the pieces of information that are most relevant and most important to them, which, you know, in this very um, time-crunched era where everybody is always doing a million things at once and checking their phones and, um, you know, their attention is divided across all of these different um, things, being able to dive right into the most important parts of the presentation right away is a really good way to hook, engage, and persuade your audience. So that was, um, you know, my presentation on my the part of my presentation on conversational presenting. I just wanted to zoom out quickly to show you what I mean by an overview. Here you can see that we have three bubbles here, and if I wanted to make this a conversational presentation. Um, I would ask you guys, okay, which are you most interested in? Flexible versus linear, static versus interactive, or two-way experiences? Which do you want to talk about first? And then I'd be able to just click right into the section that I want to talk about. So, uh, are there any questions here from the audience? We've got a bunch of great questions, actually, Susanna. And before I ask you a couple, um, I do want to clarify because we did get some questions around this as well. This session will be recorded and you will receive an email afterwards, but it will be available um, through the same link you're on right now too, just to Great. clarify that. Um, but geez, we're getting some, some really good ones. I'm trying to see which one I will pose. Okay, so 
Susanna. Um, the question mm-hmm. says, is storytelling more effective in a sales pitch situation, such as using an example of a successful past client as opposed to telling them a number of clients we've serviced? That is a really great example of storytelling in a sales pitch that I think would certainly make your pitch more successful. Um, This is not a tactic that is um, unique, however, to sales pitches. I think this works for any kind of presentation, even a simple update to your boss. Um, you know, instead of presenting just the numbers, telling a little bit of a story behind them and what they actually mean. But yeah, that's a really great example of, of using storytelling in a sales pitch, telling the story of a customer instead of just presenting the logo. Yeah, I think that fit in nicely with what you were saying about picking and choosing to and asking your audience about what they wanted to hear. Totally, totally. Um, we can do another quick question here. It says, do you have any stories of helping organizations to unlearn old habits in presenting, like death by bullet points and stats, Um, the reluctance to be more creative, or perhaps, or who perhaps sees stories as fluffy? That is a really good question. And, you know, I'm sure my customer success team would have some of those stories for you. That is something that we're really focused on when, Um, companies, organizations come to us and they're interested in purchasing, you know, a team license, a team Prezi license for their sales team or their marketing team, we do really try to make training a huge part of their onboarding experience. And that's not only training in how to use the product, but also training in how to deliver a great presentation. Um, So I don't have any of those really great stories of like an old dodgy company transitioning to nonlinear conversational presenting, but I'm sure my customer success team would have those. And if you're interested, I'm happy to follow up with you. Um, So yeah, definitely I'll, I'll make sure to, to note down who asked that question from Taylor afterwards and we can follow up with some specific stories. Definitely. And we have um, quite a few more questions in here. We will, if we don't get to you today, we will follow up afterwards please rest assured, but I'm actually going to get into the meat of my part of the presentation now, which is, yeah, excited. So it's going to, today I'm going to really expand on one of the last points Susanna was making about increasing interactivity. And I'm going to put that in the context of online presentations and specifically webinars. And I did see a question um, about how to do that. So perfect, ready to answer your question, ready to go here. And I know we have a lot of marketers in the audience today. Um, and I'm sure if you're not already running webinars or some kind of online presentations, you're probably at least considering introducing them into your marketing mix. Um, so let's do this. I'm ready to go. Um, and I'm going to start with this. Presentations, whether they're online or whether they're in person, are difficult. You're trying to remember what to say without sounding too rehearsed. You're trying to make sure you hit all your major points, you're fielding questions from the audience. It's, it's a lot to juggle. But online presentations particularly have the added challenge of trying to keep your attendees entertained and engaged when they have all of the fabulous distractions of the Internet at, the dis- at, of the internet at their disposal. It's end of quarter right now. I know Dreamforce is coming up next week for a lot of us. <laughs> And I'm totally aware of this myself as a presenter, and I promise I'm not offended if you're checking your email right now, if you're browsing LinkedIn, you're working on something else. We're all busy. It's all understandable. But the point is, if you're going to ask for an hour of someone's time, you better make it interesting. You better make it worth their while. Um, And the tools and tactics we're going to talk about today are going to help you do just that. So when you're presenting your webinar, you want it to feel more like a back and forth conversation rather than a one-sided presentation. And that's, you know, that's been a theme throughout our whole presentation today. Um, and there are a few tools that can help you prompt that two-way discussion even if you're presenting remotely. And the first one that I'm going to share is what we call polls or votes. And these are really super effective engagement tools for a couple reasons. So first, running a poll lets you grab your audience's complete attention. It says, hey, I'm here, I'm asking your opinion, would love to hear what you have to say, what's your perspective on this? They're dynamic, they're interactive, and from an audience perspective, 
they make the experience of attending a webinar feel a little less isolated. Um, oftentimes when you're watching a webinar, you're doing it at your desk, as I'm sure many of you are, or you're on the train, watching it on your commute. But polls help you see the other attendees participating and sharing their thoughts alongside you. And from a presenter's perspective, polls are useful because they give you live, real-time insight into your audience. And you could ask your audience anything from what are your revenue goals next year to how are you determining your budget for the next quarter? What's your biggest professional challenge right now? And the value you're going to get from that is raw, honest answers from the people who are paying attention to your content and your brand right now. Because honestly, let's face it, it's not very often, unfortunately, that we as marketers are able to gather a group of these potential buyers and directly ask them for their perspectives on these important topics that can help you learn more about them. So to sum it up, take advantage of this opportunity if you're presenting online, listen to what your audience is saying, because their answers can really reveal how to best follow up with them and shape your next touch points. And moving into the second tool I want to talk about today, I think that um, as marketers, we of course always want to provide our audience with a clear call to action of what we want them to do next, you know, whether that's downloading another piece of content or registering for a demo, what have you. We never want to leave our audience unsure of how to stay connected with us. But unfortunately, one of the issues or problems with traditional presentations is finding a way to actually include a solid measurable call to action. And I think this is where online presentations have a big advantage and they do distinguish themselves. And that comes in the form of what we call attachments or handouts. And Susanna and I have included five attachments here today. We've got as I mentioned earlier, we have a couple ebooks, some guides, a blog post, and a link to the Bright Talk marketing pages. But with the selective use of attachments, you can actually create a multimedia experience that goes beyond your live presentation. And the way to do that is by attaching either additional content or links to other resources. And that helps your audience really go through a multi touch experience and provides them a clear call to action a clear, clickable, measurable call to action. But if, if you're not sure about what to attach, that's, that's okay. I'd uh, suggest starting off by thinking about any content you've produced recently that ties into the subject of your webinar that you're presenting at that time. So things like blog posts, infographics, white papers, eBooks, anything that can help your audience continue the learning process works pretty well there. And other things I've seen are company social media accounts, um, any related third-party research that you want to reference, even something like a customer case study, just depending on the stage and the content of your presentation. Um, you can use those kinds of attachments to support your major points. And the last thing I'd suggest definitely including in there is a link to either your product pages, your solutions pages, or your homepage, wherever you want to guide the particular people who are attending your webinar. Um, just make it as easy as possible for interested attendees to learn more about your products and services. Uh, if I could suggest one thing, though, um, I would say that try not to go too overboard with the attachments. Um, it's really easy to want to give in and attach every piece of content you've ever created and say, here, but be really targeted with them. Make sure they relate to the topic you're discussing that day. Um, they should really be used strategically to continue nurturing your prospects because more than five or six and you, you might run the risk of potentially overwhelming your audience and causing them to skip your attachments completely. But all in all, I'd say they're a simple, effective way to increase your engagement and guide your audience through the funnel with strategic content. But um, arguably the single best way, in my opinion, to give your audience a voice in your presentation is through the use of questions, which is what we're going to discuss now. And obviously, we're taking questions today. It's one of my favorite parts of doing a live webinar. Um, and there are different ways to handle incoming questions, depending on the context of your webinar. You can either do them throughout the presentation, like we've been doing, or you can do them in a dedicated Q&A at the end. Um, either way, they're incredibly valuable because they represent really a direct line of communication to your potential customers, 
most important needs and inquiries. And in that way, they're similar to polls, but they really provide a free form. Say whatever you want to say. Ask me whatever you want to ask me. This is our chance. This is our opportunity to do it. And in any online presentation you do, whether it's a webinar or a sales pitch, anything, I highly suggest analyzing those questions because for, for really a couple of reasons. First, they show what your audience really truly cares about. What are they thinking? What do they want to see? What's important to them? And secondly, it can help you actually strengthen your content by identifying any weak areas in your presentation where you could add more depth, especially if it's a presentation you're giving more than once, multiple times frequently, can point out some potentially trouble areas where you could improve. Um, but in addition to that, questions are also a great way to continue building trusted relationships outside of the webinar because if you can't answer all of your questions during the session or if you need to supplement your answer with outside research or articles, anything like that, you can always connect with the person afterwards. And then the last tool I want to share today is a little bit different from the previous three I just talked about, and that's because it's used to re-engage your audience after your presentation versus the other three which actively engage your audience during your session. And that technique is making your webinar available on demand or recorded right after your live event. And it's absolutely, totally crucial for a couple big reasons here. And that first one being that not everyone who's interested in your content can actually attend at the time that you present it. I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but I've definitely registered for a webinar before that either I knew I couldn't attend at the time or I thought I could and then something came up. So getting that recording afterwards is super critical because I have demonstrated my interest in it and I do want to hear what you have to say, but you know, between time zones, deadlines, meetings, you just have to be realistic and understand that we're busy, things come up, that's all right. And for this reason, you know, it's important that your content is available to everyone at a time that it's convenient for them. Um, actually, earlier this year at Bright Talk, we found that you only receive about 66% of your total webinar views within the first 100 days after your live event. So in other words, that's a complete third of your audience who's watching your event more than 100 days after it was live, which is a pretty significant chunk. So that's one reason to make the recording available as soon as possible. And the second reason is kind of along the same lines because I know I'm not alone in this either, but when I find a piece of content that really resonates with me, um, I'm excited to share it on social media. I want to get it out there. I want my networks to see that I'm sharing this content that made an impact on me. And then when I see my colleagues doing the same thing, I take that as an endorsement that the content is valuable, it's worth my time, it's something that I should take the time to check out. But what I'm getting at here is that good, good content will get shared, but only if it's easily shareable. And obviously making your presentation accessible is the first step in getting your audience to share it. And even if that's just one person spreading your content, that could potentially mean a whole network of untapped audience and even potential business. So I know it might seem a little strange that I included on-demand webinars as an engagement tool, but for those reasons they really are and they can be used in some pretty powerful ways. So moving on past the engagement tools, um, and actually if you have specific questions about how to use any of those features, please feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to chat with you more about that. You can submit a question or in the feedback on your way out, I'd be happy to reach out. Um, but shifting away from the mechanics of your presentation and into the actual delivery, there are a number of in-person presentation techniques that you can apply to your online sessions as well. Um, and even though your audience can't physically see you, there's a lot they can discern over the phone. So it's really important to treat your webinar or your online event just as you would an in-person event. And I'm going to briefly talk about three tactics that you can use in your next presentation. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start with one of my favorite pieces of advice I've ever received as a presenter, and that is to stand and smile during your webinar. Because your goal as a presenter should be to come across as energized, interested and comfortable while you're presenting. And I think standing and smiling really helps you achieve that without having to think too much about it. 
So when you stand up while you're presenting, you automatically sound more confident and engaged in your subject matter versus if you're sitting down, you're in a more relaxed position and there's the possibility that you might come across as a little bit less interested in the topic you're discussing. Um, and there is a study out there from the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, oh, it's a mouthful, um, that found that standing as opposed to sitting also increases your levels of energy and well-being, both of which are fantastic things if you're presenting remotely, if you're trying to convey that enthusiasm and expertise. And similarly, sitting, or excuse me, smiling while you present lets you loosen up. It helps your audience feel a little bit more at ease, more comfortable, um, so you can use your voice to let them know that you enjoy speaking to them, you're excited about this opportunity to interact with them on a personal level. Um, and there are some studies out there that show that smiling does all kinds of great things for your health and improves your mood, reduces stress, and increases creativity. And that's even if your smile isn't totally natural, even if you have to force it a little bit, those benefits still translate and your audience will pick up on that positivity. And given that today's whole discussion is really, really about creating a memorable, persuasive experience for your audience, I think this next tip is one that will help you in the pursuit of that goal. And that's to switch up your pace and pitch when you're delivering your presentation. I did see a question come in about <laughs> avoiding the dreaded death by PowerPoint, and this, this tip really helps you do that as far as your delivery is concerned. And if you've ever taken a public speaking class, I'm sure you've heard something along these lines, but I am making this point today because it really goes double, triple, quadruple when we're talking about online presentations. Um, since your audience doesn't have that visual perception of you, they really zero in on your voice and your inflection. So keeping it varied, keeping it mixed up is a huge part of keeping their attention. Um, and I recently read a study about the most popular TED Talks, and it found that the most successful speakers have a 31% higher vocal variety than the less popular speakers, which makes sense to me. Um, obviously, no one wants to listen to a dull presentation and flashbacks to, I don't know, high school or something. <laughs> There's just so much content out there these days. It's No one has time to sit around for something that's not totally compelling. You're gonna have a hard time getting your audience to stick around if, if it's not totally compelling in every way. And my last tip, if you wanna make sure you're varying your pitch and pace appropriately, the best way to do this is by being conversational. And that really underscores everything we're talking about today, whether it's online or in person. Being conversational, being authentic with your audience is the best way to connect, the best way to make an impact on them. And because really the beauty and the value of any virtual presentation comes from the human to human connection. Um, your audience wants to feel like they're learning from a real person, someone who has experienced things firsthand in whatever field or topic they're talking about. And if they can feel your sincerity, your presentation is going to have a much greater impact on them. And online, I think especially, um, your audience really feels as if you're talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. So I encourage you to keep this in mind as you present. It'll help you speak more clearly, more simply, more meaningfully to all of your attendees. Even simple things like just addressing your audience in the second person or using strategic pauses to let your audience reflect on something you've just said, all of those things can, can go a long way in being conversational with your audience. And some, someone who's really done a ton of research on this is Nancy Duarte. She's one of the world's top experts on effective presentations. Highly recommend checking out her books. Um, she has a few of them. And her TED Talk on the structure of great talks, actually, if you haven't seen those. Um, but as a content marketer, I do find myself referring to her work and her expertise quite a bit. Um, and there was something that I read from her that I wanted to share today because it really stuck out to me. So she said that presentations are by far the most human, authentic, and relational form of communication in business today, but they're almost always boring because they are stripped of all humanness. And I think she's pretty dead on with that. Um, and I think it's something that presenters should always have in the back of their minds during any type of event, online or in person. And what I get from that is, 
it's okay to show your human side. You can still be a professional and effective presenter while showing your personality and while having those real conversations with your audience. And actually I've attached one of her blog posts to the webinar, but to just quickly share her advice here on how to bring back the humanness into your presentation before I wrap it up. She says, be you, be different, and show emotion. And I think you can read more in the attachments, but I think that really nicely sums up our presentation today. It's, it's all about creating an authentic, sincere connection with your audience, um, to share your ideas, your insights with them, and make them remember what you said. So with that, as promised, we are going to head straight into our Q&A session to answer some of your questions about creating and delivering memorable presentations. And oh my goodness, I see quite a few here. So let me see. Awesome. <clears throat> Um, oh, someone's asking about how to spell Nancy's name. So that's Nancy, and the last name is Duarte. D is in dog, U, A, R, T is in Tom, E. Highly recommend checking her out. Okay. Let's see. All right, Suzanne, I'm going to have a question for you here. Sure. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of an interactive presentation? Sure. Um, so speaking of stories, our sales team uh, has recently switched to giving more interactive sales pitches instead of memorizing a script. Um, our sales guys have a series of talking points and the, present, the deck that they use, the Prezi that they use actually, is laid out in such a way that the audience can see all of the main talking points visually when they first look at the presentation. And one of our sales guys will open by asking the audience, asking the prospect what his or her biggest pain point is that they're trying to solve with a new presentation tool. So the whole presentation is structured around these different pain points that Prezi can solve, um, but you're immediately jumping into the pain point that's most relevant to you as opposed to having to sit through all these pain points that might not apply to your business. Um, so that's an example of a conversational presentation that we give here at Prezi. Um, another great example from one of our customers, Verifone, they are you know, a big um, point of sale payment company and they, have, they go to a lot of trade shows. Trade shows are very important for, for their sales cycle. And they actually use Prezi at trade shows. They load Prezi onto giant touchscreens and iPads. So they have giant touchscreens at their booth, and then all of their sales guys have iPads and are walking around the floor with this Prezi. And they actually take it to a whole other level where they hand the iPad over to the audience and say, click on what seems most interesting or, re or relevant to you. And it's a similar visual layout where they have all of their different product offerings um, and all of the sort of different pain points and goals that each of those different products solve. So the audience can click right in and interact themselves with the presentation while the salesperson is standing next to them giving sort of the spiel based on what they clicked on. So those are two examples of conversational presentations from you know, a sales perspective. I love that. That's awesome. Thanks, Susanna. Um, and thank you to everybody who has submitted their questions. I'm not sure that we will be able to answer all of them live today, but we will be reaching out to you afterwards. Don't worry about that. Um, Susanna, I've got another one here for you. It says, is there a length for an effective presentation to prevent people from losing interest? That is a great question. And it's one that we get a lot in our, our webinars and um, you know our training teams get that question a lot. It really depends on the presentation. Um, you know, and it depends on your audience as well. I think in general, if you're speaking to a large audience, either you know, on stage or online, the attention span tends to be a little bit shorter because it is less of a sort of personal um, interaction. I think that when you are delivering more one-on-one -on -one presentations or presentations to a small group, you have a little bit more flexibility. For one, because you can very quickly gauge how interested your audience is when you can actually see them right in front of you and you know, it's a relatively small number of people. 
So that can help you give a sense of whether you're going too long or you're, you know, if your audience is still really engaged, maybe you can go into a little bit more detail and extend what you're going to say. Um, so I, I would say the, the larger your audience in general, the shorter the presentation should be. But again, if you're using these tactics and you're telling great stories and you're making your presentation more interactive, that both of those are really great tools for extending the amount of time that your audience is willing to pay attention. Um, so, you know, if you're just presenting numbers in charts on a board, then your attention span is probably going to be a little bit shorter for your audience than if you're using all of these great tactics that, that you can use to keep your talk really engaging. Perfect. Thank you. And we're, we're getting a lot of questions for you, Suzanne. I hope you don't mind. I hope we're not, not at all. overloading you. Okay, them. great. <laughs> I, I'm excited to have your expertise here today, so I'm going to ask you all the questions that I can fit in. Um, so this one says, typically C-level and VP levels prefer three to four slides to the point, just facts and actions required from them. How is it possible to include stories for this type of audience? Absolutely. That's a really good point that for, you know, executives, people who are incredibly strapped for time, I think the same sort of applies for prospects in sales situations, but you definitely want to make the action that you're asking them to take incredibly clear. The next step needs to be incredibly clear. Um, but I think in terms of explaining what that next step is and why it's important, you can certainly use storytelling. I mean, you mentioned they want four or five slides with facts and figures. Instead of just throwing out the number, explain what that number actually means. So if the, if the number is, you know, our Latin American team closed 45 deals this last week, then maybe instead of just saying we closed 45 deals in Latin America, you tell the story of one of those deals or you tell the story of, the salesperson who closed seven deals over the course of three days and it's really amazing and you know they're a star player so again it's about figuring out what the meaning is behind the numbers that you need to present and it, it doesn't have to be a long story it can be a sentence it can be a sentence about that great sales guy who you know was working really hard and it came down to the wire and he managed to convince this huge company to purchase and this is one of the 45 deals that we closed this week in Latin America so again, it's just about adding in those details to bring the numbers and the facts to life. Awesome. Okay. There's a question here that I think I'll take, give you give you a little breather, Susanna, <laughs> uh, but I'll be back with more. So it says, with polls or other audience engagement tools, how do you recommend having those ready to, oh, excuse me, do you recommend having those ready to go? prior to beginning the webinar or do you create them based on the flow of conversation? My concern would it would be it might break up flow to create them on the spot, but one created in advance might not be too relevant if the conversation veers in another direction. Um, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting point. I think that's a good point you bring up. Generally, if I'm going to do a poll in a webinar, I have an idea of what I want to know from the audience beforehand. Um, and there are ways you can definitely incorporate that into the flow of your presentation. And generally, I recommend doing it really at the beginning of the presentation because that will, A, grab your audience's attention really quickly, and B, it won't break up, it won't awkwardly break up your presentation later down the line. So doing that up front can actually be pretty effective. Um, if you come up with something that you want to ask during the flow of the conversation, that's okay too. You can always ask people to submit something through the questions pane or if you want to ask them after the webinar, you can have them submit it through the feedback panel. But I think you can't really go wrong um, with polls. It just it depends on A, the type of content you're presenting and B, what you want to know from your audience. I think it's also fun to see other people participating in those polls and um, and for the presenter, it's fun to, I don't know, usually when I do polls, I'm pretty, I'm pretty shocked at what the results I get are. Um, and that's why I'm asking the questions, because I genuinely don't know the answer, and I want to see what the audience has to say about it. So I hope that answered your question there. Okay. Um, there's a question here. 
Oh, this is this is interesting. Okay, Susanna, isn't nonlinear mm -hmm. presentation really going against storytelling? Because storytelling is all about placing the pieces in a perfect sequence rather than a customized sequence. Sure. So nonlinear presenting um, doesn't mean that you don't have any particular order for your content. It means that you have you can think of your content and your stories within your presentation as sort of these modular pieces that you can rearrange however you want. So, um, you know, for example, if I wanted to present this presentation non-linearly, I might start by asking the audience, what are you interested in talking about first? Do you want to know more about stories or do you want to mo know more about interactivity? And if the answer is interactivity, then I jump into this section, but I go through this section through in a set path. So this part of the presentation is sort of linear, but the overall presentation, once I've gone through this section, once again, we come out to the overview and we have the opportunity to choose our own adventure, so to speak, and go into another part. Um, so it's that level of flexibility where you, know, you have the ability to choose what you want to share when, but it doesn't mean that you, um, you know, as you say, you can tell a story in sequence and then you can move on to the next story or the next fact, depending on what your audience is interested in moving through. Does that make sense? I think it does. And I think th there's another question here that kind of goes along with that. Um, when you're asking your, it says, when you're asking your audience about what they want to hear about, how do you control your delivery and tell an effective story when you're not sure what you're going to be talking about exactly? Yeah, that's a really good question. That comes back to my point about um, not developing a script for your presentation, but rather developing these distinct talking points and having the talking points, you know, becoming really familiar with the talking points. So you know exactly what you want to cover when a certain topic comes up, but giving yourself the flexibility for your audience to determine which topics they want to talk about when. Um, you know, that's really the key. So developing those talking points for each distinct modular part of your presentation, you know, once you get into that part of the presentation, you're super comfortable. You know everything that you need to say. You know all of the content that goes with that section. But it's the flow that isn't predetermined so that your audience can decide what the flow is. And both of these questions are um, things that we cover in the conversational presenting ebook that we've included in the handout section. So if you guys want to learn more about sort of what conversational presenting is and how you can implement it in your business, I definitely re recommend downloading that ebook and taking a look. It's full of a lot of really great information. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is a great resource. I was taking a look after you sent it over, Susanna, and I, I will definitely be referring back to that. So I recommend everyone check that out. Um, there, I did get a quick question here that I'm happy to answer about um, the three tips that Nancy Duarte offered in that blog post. It was be you, be different, and show emotion. And um, as I mentioned, you can find that in the attachments tab. Okay, so I think we might have time for one more here, Susanna, and it says, sure. how do you do interactive with experienced people on the subject? Hold on, let me make sure I'm reading this right. I think the question is saying, how do you make your presentation interactive with people who are experienced, but who need to learn something new? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. That comes up a lot for you know trainings and whatnot. How do you make that interactive? And for something where you do need to go through all of the content, you know, it's not like a sales pitch or a project update where um, it's not critical that the audience gets every single piece of information. With a training, it's a little bit different, right? You need to go through a certain um, set of concepts or whatever. So in that case, I recommend making the flow of your presentation, not the interactive part, but rather building interactivity into the presentation with the stories and examples that you share for each section. 
So, you know, you go through section one and maybe you have three or four different examples of the concepts that you're trying to teach in section one. You let your audience pick and choose which examples they want to see, what order they want to see them in. You give your audience a little bit of choice, but you go through each section, um, you know, section one, which story do you want to talk about? Which example do you want to talk about? Section two, same thing. Section three, but the path of your presentation is a little bit more set. So again, it's just about giving your audience the choice to um, choose what, you know, how they want to learn rather than choose what content they, they want to cover because you have to cover all the content. Perfect. Um, thank you, Susanna. I do see a few more questions in here, but they might be a little bit more specific. So okay. um, either they're questions about Prezi or requests for additional resources. So if your question wasn't answered, we will be reaching out to you. Um, but I want to thank everyone. I especially want to thank Susanna and our audience for attending today. Um, if you have a chance. Thank you. To, no, I love this. We love having you here and love learning about the science behind presentations because, as you mentioned, they're so important, especially for us marketers out there. But um, if you have a chance, please leave us a rating on the way out. We'd love to hear some feedback, what you liked, what you'd like to hear more of. And we will be reaching out to you if your question was lingering. And feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, thank you, Susanna. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.